Don't clap yet. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. All right, I'm going to do the best I can with the um, with the mouse. I'm, I'm a lot of things, but techno savvy is not one of them. So be patient with me. Um, our talk this morning is related to um, dementia assessment, but it's beyond the numbers. I've, I've purposely titled it Beyond the Numbers because I, um, for a variety of reasons, and I hope by the end of this you appreciate that it's just more than the, the numerical decline on a standardized scale that defines the person um, with, with dementia. So as they travel along the decline in cognition, uh, and I would suggest function and frailty. Um, so that's pretty much what I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes. Um, as an educator, we're trying to get away from slides. It's called death by PowerPoint. So um, I'm going, I do because there was a certain amount of content that we did have to review. Um, I will be doing some slides, but the majority of this is hopefully going to be focusing on individuals both within this video and then a particular case study that I put together for us where we actually appreciate um, beyond the numbers. So every good lecture starts with a definition. So by definition, dementia is an acquired global impairment of a couple of things, intellect, memory, and personality. But what's unique about dementia is that there is not an impairment in the level of consciousness, okay? Making it very different from other uh, neurological diseases. It almost always, except with a few exceptions and a few uh, particular types of dementia, has a long duration which involves progression along a continuum of decline, as well as um, most of the dimensions are irreversible. Okay, and until this point in time, no cures for them. <coughs> okay. Just recently, the DMS-5 has gotten away from classifying, uh, or has changed the way, thankfully, dementia is classified, because I think by making this change in the classification, it will help decrease the stigma of this diagnosis, which till today, still today, this diagnosis does carry. And it's, instead of staging the progression of dementia, what they've done is they have defined dementia as neurocognitive decline or neurocognitive disorders, even better, neurocognitive disorders, okay? So they've actually made it a disease of the brain just like coronary artery disease is a disease of the heart. So by doing this, I think that over time, the stigma associated with dementia will hopefully decrease. And they've divided it into two kind of stages, if you will, mild neurocognitive disorders and major neurocognitive disorders. So that's the new classification for dementia. When we talk about that, this reclassification, when we're talking about mild neurodegenerative disorders, we're talking about disorders that interfere with everyday activities, but don't preclude the person's ability to live independently. They can still function, okay? They have problems learning new things, but they're still able to recall um, things that they've been doing for years. They're very good at recalling the, the distant past. They have difficulty with learning new things, taking in new information, processing new things, and they may develop um, difficulty in retaining. Okay. And some difficulty in recalling, especially recent activities. As the disorder progresses, and we move into the major categories. The major categories kind of coincide with what we used to call moderate to severe dementia, okay? So in that particular stage, what we see is memory loss, 
that is very serious now. It's at a serious level that handicaps the person's ability to live independently. Very familiar information that was retained previously um, usually stays intact at the beginning of the, what used to be the moderate stage, but by the time we move into severe stage, even that starts to fade, okay? <laughs> Names and places that a person used to be able to recall um, and know starts getting lost. And as the person moves along the major continuum, okay, more towards the end, this is where you see people not recognizing even family members who um, they've, they've known for years. They may respond to the person, um, but they don't necessarily um, have the ability to re recall their name. Okay, I have a, a neighbor next door who's Chinese, and her mother is still over in Hong Kong. She's lived in America for a while, but her mom is still in Hong Kong, and she's declining from... Um, advanced stages of neurocognitive decline and my neighbor goes to see her about once every year or so when she can because it's a very long trip and it's a very expensive trip and so but she said to me the other day she said I have to go see my mother because they send me videos of her on the phone and she doesn't respond to any of them and when I go over there and I sing to her she doesn't know who I am but she holds my hand while I'm singing to her. So her, her mom is really um, towards, towards the end. She hasn't spoken a spoken word in five years, my neighbor told me. Okay. This is a short, very short, can you make this thing work for me? Very short facts and figure video from the Alzheimer's Association about the facts and figures of the impact of a diagnosis of neurocognitive uh, decline in uh, 2016. So it's last year's data, but it's still pretty up to date and you can assume that it's only going up. Um, did you do the open the hyperlink thing? Yeah. Is it gonna work? If it doesn't, it's not a big deal. If it's not gonna work, it's fine. There it is. Oh, okay. Now you make it big by by doing this. <laughs> Make it big. Thank you. This one, you really read this one, so. Okay, make this go away and bring up my PowerPoint. Next time I'll bring my own mouse, I promise. Okay, thank you. Oh dear, we didn't shut them off. <laughs> okay. Well, my arrow's no longer moving here. This is a short video again um, by Dr. Richard Taylor, and I'll let him tell his story. I'm just gonna plug in the speakers. Okay. Whoops, somehow it got moved. 
Julia, you gotta help me with that. The Alzheimer's Association video does a really nice job about talking about the quantitative impact, dollars and cents, um, and the significance of this disease as far as incidence and prevalence. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wolf here starts to talk about more of the qualitative impact of his getting the diagnosis. And I will just let him, he does an eloquent job in a very short amount of time talking about the impact of this diagnosis on a person. This is my new purpose in life. It's to say that people with dementia are whole people and should be treated as whole people. I am a whole person. I am not half empty. I am not half full. I am not declining. I am a person. Now, I may be a different person slightly than I was yesterday. But I am still a whole person. See, we need enablers, not disablers. And most organizational programs are focused, I believe, at disabling. If you see us making a mistake or an error, you take it away from us. I watched the day I tried to fill out a form and the sun was going. So the day of the summer walked out and gently took the form out of his hand and he was here by the new husband. And he erased the phone number right in front of his hand. Put the right phone number in, filled out the address, uh, and gave it back to his dad and said, Here, Dad, I love Now that was a loving gesture from the son's perspective. But what did it tell the band? You're not perfect. And by the way, Dan, you'll never have to fill out a form the rest of your life. We'll take care of all that. Well, there goes another piece of my life. I will end up having people be disabled. But the core issue is, we're still whole people. We still have a right to personal dignity. Now you can enable us to hang on to that dignity. Alzheimer's is called the long goodbye. So when the gun goes off and they say, you have dementia, probably the Alzheimer's type, everybody starts to say goodbye to you. People stop calling me, my friends. And I would call them and say, why aren't you coming over? Why aren't you talking to me? They'd say, I don't know what to say to you. And I would say, well, say hello. <laughs> So I talked earlier about the stigma, and you heard Richard talk about how getting the diagnosis and then begins this long goodbye, and the stigma attached with the long goodbye, whether it's Alzheimer's dementia or one of the other dementias, this stigma, and I'm so happy that they changed the name of this, um, because the stigma has a way of robbing people of who they are, okay, as they move along this continuum. So these pictures, I think, speak a thousand words about the isolation that occurs, the confusion that occurs, uh, the 
the just sitting in the wheelchair kind of uh, perspective, whether the person's wheelchair bound or not, they have no purpose. Okay, they have no purpose. Um, they're just an empty shell of themselves or they see themselves becoming just an empty shell, okay? And oftentimes what happens in the course of the progression of dealing with this disease is caregivers get very tired and along this continuum they'll say, they'll say you know, this isn't what I signed up for. This is not the man I married. Um, and, and then they feel bad about that. So that becomes a big issue for us who are in, in the care of the person with the disease, supporting that caregiver also becomes a major challenge in our, in our care. Okay, so in that real estate business, it's all about location, 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 right? In the dementia business and in the cognitive decline business, it's all about location too, and it's about the location of the neurodegenerative disease and where it's occurring in the brain. So just to review, um, we have four lobes, four major lobes of our cerebellum, or our cerebrum, excuse me, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And to the right of that slide, you can see that each one of these lobes has major functions that it's responsible for. So the frontal lobe is responsible more for speech, emotion, and it's responsible for those higher level things that take time to develop as we, as we continue along the growth and development continuum. The frontal lobe is the last lobe of the brain that develops. And this is what's often used to do to um, define what happens um, or, or to explain, I should say, adolescent behavior. And the fact that they're risk takers, their judgment is impaired sometimes, they don't make the best decisions, they don't realize the consequences to things um, because their frontal lobe still isn't fully developed. They're risk takers, um, their judgment, you know, they just, they don't take the time to think about the consequences of what they might be um, doing or a decision that they're, they're making. And I stress this because I'm going to get to a point later on in this, in this conversation. The parietal lobe right behind the frontal lobe is responsible for speech, taste. This is the sensory lobe, okay? Um, speech, taste, and reading. <clears throat> the temporal lobe is located over on the sides above our ears, responsible for hearing, smell, and auditory association. So when we hear things, we are able to associate it when our temporal lobe is intact. The occipital lobe is responsible for visual association and for our vision. So I say this because Depending upon the location of this neurodegeneration, this is going to help explain to you so that you can explain to your patients and their caregivers why the signs and symptoms that we're seeing might be happening. So, the Alzheimer's Disease Association puts a very nice video together, but I'm not going to take the time to go through it. And it talks about the 10 warning signs of dementia. We will post this video on our, our CED website, though, and then all the hyperlinks will be intact if you really want to watch these or suggest that your patients and family members watch them to help um, explain and support the services of the Alzheimer's Association as well. So we see as an early warning sign of dementia memory loss. We see difficulty with performing familiar tasks. We may see problems developing with language and especially with word finding. Um, they may, they may uh, explain that they need, um, they need that thing that I do this to, to my teeth, but they can't recall the name of a toothbrush, okay? Or that, that device that I use to shave my face, okay? They can't recall razor. Okay. They may become disoriented to time and place, especially when 
you take them to an unfamiliar space. So this is why patients who may have been covering their cognitive decline very well by doing their routine kind of events and activities in their neighborhood and getting to the grocery store the same way and um, going to this church and, and that store and staying with a very routine, familiar uh, list of activities, um, when you take these people to a different environment, for example, on vacation, they become very confused and disoriented. They're in a different motel room. Um, they, they don't recognize how to get from point A to point B. And I lived through this with a friend of mine who at the time I didn't know was having problems with cognitive decline. When we went to another friend's uh, wedding for her son in Las Vegas, and my friend had been doing a very good job of, she had her routine down. She lived by herself. She had been um, divorced for years. She had her routine down. The minute we took her to Las Vegas, I had her and my mother with me. I had no idea this was going on. This was probably back when she was in her 50s. Um, we get to Las Vegas. She's staying in a different hotel, and anybody that's been to Las Vegas knows how overwhelming it could be. We get, to, we get to her hotel because she wanted to stay somewhere which was least expensive. My mother would only stay at the Bellagio, so we stayed at the Bellagio. My friend was staying down the street, which in Las Vegas is quite some hikes. And um, we go to, um, from our, our hotel to her hotel to pick her up to go to the wedding. And I'm knocking on her door and she didn't answer. She didn't answer. So now time is ticking away. We still had to take a taxi to the hotel where the, the wedding was taking place. And I didn't want to be late for my friend's wedding. There were very few of us that were going to be there. So I said to my mom, I said, we got to go. And she said, well, what about, what about Joanne? And I said, well, I don't know, but we got to go. And it was before the days of cell phones. So um, not that she would have had one anyway. But <laughs> we get to the hotel where the wedding was, and there's still no Joanne. I thought maybe she went ahead of us. Maybe she didn't want to wait. She just went. She's not there. We get back from the hotel after the wedding. She never appeared. And there's this scathing message on my motel room phone. The light is flashing when you walk in the room. And my mother said, Linda, somebody called you. And I pick it up, and here's this message from Joanne. And she is just ripping me up one side and down the other about how I could leave her. And I said, Joanne, I came to your hotel room. I knocked and knocked and knocked. And she said, no, you didn't. You left me out. You purposely left me out. And when I shared that with my friend, she said, Linda, I've been worried about her for a long time. And so taking her out of her routine was enough to trigger that behavior. So that's why I share that story with you. Um, and that's really important for you to share with your family members as well. Misplacing things is another common. Um, you know, misplacing things and then... Um, not remembering where you put them and then blaming somebody else because they moved them, that's often another sign. Okay, changes in personality. Clearly there's, you know, uh, differences in the individual and their, and their personality changes. They tend to become very passive and uh, lack initiative as the, as the disorder progresses as well. Again, that whole sense of purposelessness. Now, just like there's signs of dementia, there are different types of dementia. Um, I think of dementia as an umbrella term. It's kind of a global term, okay? We saw the definition in the first slide of the, the, the three categories of decline, but there's different reasons why dementia occurs. Um, there's Alzheimer's dementia, which is the most common. Uh, we're gonna go through each one of these very quickly. Vascular dementia, the frontal temporal dementia that I talked about earlier, uh, Lewy body's dementia, Wernicke's and Korsakoff's um, syndromes, and also there's um, yeah, uh, Jacob's disease, which was commonly known as mad cow disease. Um, any of you that are familiar with the history of Buffalo, the mayor of, of, of the city of Buffalo, one of the previous mayors was diagnosed with that and died very quickly. That one has a very short, uh, rapid progression. 
Alzheimer's disease, as I said, is the most common um, type of de dementia. About 55% of the dementias are related to the Alzheimer's type. It has a very slow, insidious onset. Um, memory loss is the most prominent symptom in Alzheimer's type, and it tends to exaggerate the normal aging process of the brain. When you look at the pathology of people with Alzheimer's disease, um, their brain degeneration, uh, degeneration is very advanced for their chronological age. When I was in nursing school back in the 70s, ages ago, they described Alzheimer's disease as Swiss cheese brain, where you actually had holes. Does anybody remember the Swiss cheese brain? You're all too young. Okay, well, I'm, you're gonna get to believe me. It was called disease of, uh, it looked like, because on pathology, um, on autopsy, the brain had holes in it. Okay, the diagnosis requires both cognitive impairment, loss, and loss of independence in the person's ability to perform their activities of daily living. Vascular dementia is the second most um, common type of dementia. It counts for about 20% of the dementias. It often presents itself as Alzheimer's disease. Similar progression, uh, similar behaviors, okay, similar clinical presentation. But um, when you do MRIs and CAT scans of people um, with vascular type dementia, you can actually see vas vascular insults in the, in the brain tissue itself that accounts for the, um, the problems, depending upon, again, location, location, location. Okay. Um, this is the type of, of dementia that occurs commonly in persons who have had major strokes, for example, where they've really occluded or wiped out major components of their brain tissue. Um, this is why you see the emotional uh, liability that you see in patients after strokes commonly. Um, it's because their emotional centers, okay, have been impacted by the vascular disease. And this is not to say that patients can't have mixed dementias. We often see a mix of Alzheimer's disease and vascular um, dementias as well. Dementia of the Lewy body type is the third most common. It accounts for about 15 percent of uh, Alzheimer's, of, of dementias, excuse me. And when we talk about this, when I teach nursing students about this, I say, look, if somebody has to tell you, somebody tells you, you have, you're going to get dementia, pick one. Don't pick this one. Okay. This dementia is a very troubling dementia. Okay. Um, you have fluctuations in cognitive impairment. Sometimes these people are perfectly lucid and other times they are so overcome by their, their visual and uh, verbal, uh, visual and auditory hallucinations that they just are in their own in their own world okay they there is abnormal abnormalities in consciousness with this type of dementia there's clouding of the consciousness with this type of dementia so sometimes they're totally lucid sometimes they're kind of vague and distant and other times they're totally troubled by their hallucinations there's a lot of psychosis associated with Lewy body's dementia this is why i tell you this is not the one to sign up for you have to pick one, don't pick this one, okay? We often see Lewy body's dementia when we have persons with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And what makes this, this dementia very unique is that whole aspect of the paranoia and the troubling hallucinations. They're never nice, they're never nice hallucinations. They're very troubling. I remember my father-in-law had a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and late on in the course of his Parkinson's disease, he developed Lewy body dementia, and he believed that the pictures on the walls contained people, and the people were very mean, and the people came out of the walls and were throwing things at him and his wife, who was his primary caretaker, and more so, they were putting pins in his automated recliner chair that he had to sit in because his Parkinson's was so advanced. He was stiff and it was the only 
the only chair that he could sit in because it automatically got him up to a standing position and he wouldn't sit in it because he believed that the bad people in the pictures put pins in his chair. So the family member, the nurse in the family decides, well, this is easy fix. Let's take the, let's take the pictures off the walls. We thought we had it solved. We took the pictures off the walls. Then guess what? What happened? The people didn't go away. The mean people didn't go away. They still they were there with their pins and they were still throwing things at them. They were coming out of the walls. Okay. Those hallucinations were so real to him, there was no convincing him. Okay. Other causes of dementia um, we see related to alcohol consumption. Um, you, you often see uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy and Korsakoff syndrome in your patients with chronic alcohol, uh, alcohol disease. There are some reversible dementias. There's very few of them. Uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus is one that once you do the surgical repair, um, the symptoms tend to subside. And then there are also dementias that occur as a result of space-occupying lesions, brain tumors, depending upon the location of those tumors. And oftentimes when you remove the tumor, um, the dementia symptoms will resolve as well. So we talk about how do we screen for dementia, and the work of our Center for Excellence is focused on getting folks like you folks out here and everywhere in the seven counties of Western New York screening early for dementia, for cognitive decline, or neurodegenerative changes in your patients in the primary care settings. Okay, there's a bunch of tools that are out there that could be used. The one that most people are familiar with is the MMSE the mini mental status exam. It takes a long time to, um, to give that, um, but it is one of the most recognized tools for screening. However, um, now if you're using it, it's copyrighted, so you should be theoretically paying for using it. So we've gotten away from that tool for two reasons in the primary care setting. One, you gotta pay for it, and two is it takes too long to do in a primary care setting. We want to um, give you a tool that can be used and done in your primary care settings in five to 10 minutes max. And that, for that, we suggest the Minicog and the MOCA. Um, also, it's very important to get information from your caregivers. And we use the AD8 tool, which is a list of eight activities, and we have the person, the caregiver, rate whether or not the person is doing it, yes or no, okay? Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the screening tools today. That's a conversation that, that we can come to your practices and help you with and train your staff as well. But that's not what this talk is supposed to be about. We'll get on to that later. So when we talk about progression of dementia beyond the numbers, we talk about, remember I talked about that growth and development um, continuum and the development of the brain lobes, for example. <clears throat> that growth and development continuum, when you think about the progression of neurocognitive degeneration disorders, think about, instead of evolution, think about involution. So what we see in dementia is we see persons who lose the ability to do the things that developed last. And what did I tell you developed last? What lobe of the brain develops last? Frontal temporal. This is why some of the early onset symptoms are related to inappropriate behaviors, lack of decision making, um, not re realizing consequences, giving their social security numbers to the nice man that called on the phone because he asked me for it. Okay, their judgment starts to go. So think about neurodegenerative disorders as diseases of decline of diseases of involution, if you will, and the progression reverses the normal growth and development pattern. This slide talks about scoring um, and changing and, and interpreting the numbers in relationship to either mild cognitive, a neurocognitive impairment, or uh, major neurocognitive impairment. So um, again, we're not gonna take the time to watch those videos, they're very good. Um, you can watch them or suggest that your patient watches them. 
This is the last slide, um, and we are going to watch this, so if you could get. Um, this is a story of a couple. You might need a napkin or a Kleenex. Um, and it tells their story about their journey and their family's journey with um, dementia. It's one of my favorite songs, too. I've watched it a few times, so I don't cry anymore. <laughs> um, and I did that on purpose. It's impossible Tell the sun to leave the sky It's just impossible Maybe it's got a zoom, it's got a little somewhere, right? Please Should we do something? Do we need to resuscitate it and start it again? <laughs> resuscitate it. Make it come back. Yes. There we go. There we go. It's going to work this time. See, it's loading. Like my granddaughter used to say, Grandma, it's loading. We didn't see that before, so that's probably a good sign. Yeah, no, it was there. Oh, it was? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Leave it small for a minute. Maybe yeah. it didn't like being big. It's impossible. Tell the sun to leave the sky, it's just impossible. It's impossible. That's the baby not to so I'm really happy about this, that disclaimer at the end. It's not to say that all healthcare providers are bad people because that's not what the message is here. Um, but it's just very, um, heart-wrenching to watch people's stories. Okay, so I'm gonna end my talk with a case study because all good presenters do that instead of PowerPoint. So that's the end of the PowerPoint. This is a case study and this case study is about Mrs. L. And Mrs. L is a 91-year-old female with a long-standing medical history of hypertension hypercholesteremia, type 2 diabetes managed with oral agents, and most recently a history, a diagnosis of stage 1 breast cancer um, at the age of 88. Mrs. L was born at home in Buffalo, New York in 1926, um, and she grew up on the west side of Buffalo. For six years, she was an only child until her parents um, presented her with a younger brother in 1932. And this begins Mrs. L's story. At age 10 years old, she began making bread and cooking fudge. This is her, one of her original bread pans. Her cooking skills increased and expanded um, by the age of 15 when her father um, suddenly died and Mrs. L was left to be in charge of the, the um, household activities so her mother could go to work to support Mrs. L and her younger brother. Mrs. L became responsible for raising her brother um, and herself so that mom could go off to work Mom had a fifth grade education, so there was a limited number of things that she could do, but she did find herself a factory job where she made enough money to support Mrs. L and her brother. 
At age 19, Mrs. L got married to the older boy around the block. He was 21. As newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. L lived in the third floor apartment that Mr. L fixed for them in, their, in Mrs. L's in-laws house, where Mrs. L now had the delightful responsibility of helping to raise Mr. L's four younger brothers. So she began, she continued cooking. She took on a lot of cleaning responsibilities for this whole three-story house with, you can imagine, five, well, Mr. and Mrs. L were in it, and then there was Mr. L's parents and four, four younger siblings. So Mrs. L got to be responsible for a large part of the cooking and all of the cleaning in the house, even second and first floor. So this is where she became very proficient at cleaning. She tells a story about she used to clean the windows so much that Mr. L told her, one of these days, those windows are going to fall out because you're, getting, you're, you're destroying the caulking. Stop cleaning them so much. And she just got it. She said, no, these windows have to be cleaned. And, you know, I got to keep this house in order or your mother's not going to be happy and blah, blah, blah. And we got to live here. Where are we going to go? So one day while she was cleaning the window, guess what happened? Third floor apartment, the window did fall out. Mrs. L was running down the stairs to catch it. Like, she's not catching, right? <laughs> but that was just her instinct. Okay. Okay. Mrs. L was quite the um, excellent cook by then. Um, she was a very avid and uh, frugal shopper. She knew how to pick up the best meats and the best fruits and stuff. In fact, one of the local grocers told her at one point, you know, you're a much better shopper than your mother ever was. And she said, yeah, I know. And besides being very wise at picking out the best things, she was also very frugal. And she saved a penny a week from the grocery money to buy this 69 cent stainless steel spoon that for the course of her lifetime, she always needed to know where the spoon was because she knew how long she saved to get this 69 cent spoon. It's stainless steel. Unlike most women in her time, Mrs. L worked, but she wasn't allowed to go back to work until um, 1950s, because um, by that time, in 1953, they had um, saved up enough money to build their own house. So Mrs. L finally got to live in her own house with her husband, and they had a daughter by then and one on the way. And unlike most people, well, most women at that time, Mrs. L wanted to work outside the house. And Mr. L was opposed to it, but he told her, you can work outside the house as long as you're home by the time these kids get home from school. And by the way, I expect a hot meal um, at 5.30 when I get home every night. So if you can meet those two conditions, you can go to work. <clears throat> so she did. Initially, she went to work downtown as a secretary for an insurance adjuster. She would drive downtown every day in a standard shift car and pray the rosary, and then make sure that she was home by one or two o'clock in the afternoon for the, first, for the first child arriving home from school. And then she'd spend the afternoon doing household stuff and making sure dinner was on the table. Mrs. L was always committed to educating her. She had two daughters. She was always very interested and committed to educating those two daughters and she would do anything it took to make sure that they got to go to college because she wanted to be 100% sure that her daughters had the opportunity. And this wasn't at a time where girls necessarily had to go to college. I mean, it was nice if you wanted to, but you were still, it was still the era of, well, college is for the boys, okay? Girls, the girls don't necessarily have to go to college. They could probably go get some training and secretarial skills if they really needed to work, but they didn't need to go to college. My mother was hell bent on the fact that her daughters would be independent and educated. So Mrs. L continued the cooking and the cleaning and the baking and the working 
And at one point, after working downtown for a number of years, she had the opportunity to work at the, um, to take the civil service job. And she got herself a job at the University of Buffalo in the Health Sciences Library. And then she, at that point, she started working for the state and as a, um, a librarian assistant in acquisitions. So she worked with the librarians and was responsible for um, cataloging the books and putting them on the shelves. This was the days of the Dewey Decimal cataloging system where you had things, remember, you probably don't remember this either, <laughs> the things in the boxes where you used to go to the card catalog and look up your book or your, your journal and then you had to go to the, the shelf and hope that it was there. How, how many hours did we all spend doing this, right? And then, and then if you were lucky enough to go to a big enough school, they actually get a copy machine, but you could only make X number of copies, okay? And then you had to pray that you not only found a journal, but that somebody had ripped the pages that you needed out of the journal or the book, right? Yeah, yeah, well, my mom was responsible for this coding, this card cataloging system. And she worked, she worked at the university um, for a long time under that system and then moved to the computerized, whatever it's called today. She knew all about that cataloging stuff. She became a widow. Mrs. L became a widow very suddenly at the age of 64. Mr. L was 66 when he died. And so she busied herself staying, um, she busied herself staying employed and she spent a lot of time with her kids and her two daughters and by that time she was a grandma. Um, and so she took great pride in um, taking care of the grandchildren and she was an avid um, crocheter and knitter. She made baby blankets and every kid had a sweater with a matching hat every winter. Um, every Christmas there was handmade stuff made by grandma. In 1993, Mrs. L celebrated her 70th birthday. She was a widow by then, but there was still a lot of, uh, Mr. L's brothers were all still alive. It was a huge birthday party. Um, this is a picture of Mrs. L at her 70th birthday party. Um, she, was, she loved her beer. She loved her beer, so for her 70th birthday, somebody bought her this fancy beer glass. Okay. Um, and, and she kept working, uh, stayed involved. She worked with a lot of young people. She used to come home and um, tell her daughter stories about the affairs of going on with her young uh, co-workers, which would make their heads curl because they really didn't want to hear this stuff coming out of their mother's mouths. But she was, she was a cool, she was cool. And she was totally on it. Do you know what they're doing these days? <laughs> Can you imagine? No, Mom, I can't imagine. Please. It was before the days of TMI, or I would have said TMI. <laughs> Mrs. L continued to work, and it got to the point where she was 78 years old, and she got tired of paying income tax. She said, can you imagine being 78 years old and having to pay all this money to the, to the government? This, it should be illegal to take my money like this. And so we, we had to finally convince her that, well, perhaps you should retire. This is why people retire. Because as long as you continue to collect Social Security and a salary from the university, you're going to pay income tax. And it was a huge chunk of money every year. So at 78, she finally made the decision to retire for the first time. She dilly-dallied around, but soon found herself back at the university in the acquisitions and cataloging department part-time. She was on a temporary state line, and she worked there for another four years before then the new governor at the time um, decided that the state university system couldn't afford temporary employees, um, so he eliminated the temporary positions and then she retired from the university for the second time. She was 82, okay? But she didn't stop working. What she did was she found herself 
Um, her, one of her daughters was working for a primary care doc, and she found herself a part-time position assisting the billing person in the primary care office because Mrs. L used to balance her checkbook to the penny, to the penny. And it was before computerized a banking, which she still doesn't believe in as of even today. Um, she would call them on the phone and say, you made a mistake. I know my balance is such and such. And she would be on the phone with them for minutes, half hours. Sometimes she'd have to call them back. Okay? But she took real good care of her money. At age 88, oh, by the way, she didn't retire from working even part-time at that doctor's office till the doctor went, uh, closed his practice. So finally, it, I think it was 87, she had to stop working. At 88 years old, um, she continued to cook. She continued to clean, but cleaning was getting difficult because she could no longer, she had a hard time getting off the floor from her hands and knees because she would only wash the floor with, in her hands and knees. She didn't believe in mops. Mops, you didn't get anything clean with mops. You had to be on your hands and knees. So the, the floor she, she left for one of her daughters to do, but still cleaning those windows, scrubbing these pots and pans till they were pristine. She would go get her nails done every week. I said, why are you bother doing that? Because when you cook on the weekends, the nail polish was gone because she used to scrub. I swear she had stock in the Brillo company. <laughs> and we still had the 69 cent spoon. She cooked until November of 2015, so about two years ago, she stopped cooking. And she stopped cooking um, because she was home by herself cooking one day, and she got distracted and went to the bathroom, and then from the bathroom she went back to bed, and she left the pot on the stove. And when her daughter um, got home, there was this odor in her apartment. She lived in an in-law apartment attached to her daughter's house. And when she, um, when a daughter walked in from the garage in November of 2015, there was this really funky smell, like chemical gases burning. So the daughter walks into, opens the apartment door, and the apartment is already halfway full of this white smoke. And mom's asleep in the bed. So daughter moves mom out opens windows, finds this pot, this burnt pot, smoking away on top of the stove, takes, takes the pot up into the garage and proceeds to clear the house of the smoke. And so it was not until that event that the daughter convinced Mrs. L that she probably shouldn't be cooking home alone anymore. Okay, She could cook on weekends or she could cook as soon as somebody got home, she could start cooking but she was not to cook a home alone anymore. About two weeks after that smoke event, she was carrying a plate of food that she had prepared into the daughter's kitchen for dinner and tripped and fell and landed um, on her wrist. She fell forward, she turned around and fell forward and landed on her uh, white wrist, which was her dominant hand and quickly got up and said, oh, I'm okay, but this wrist kind of hurts. This hurts, but nothing else hurts. I'm fine. She didn't bump her head. <clears throat> we all saw it. My son was across the room. He was horrified. He goes lunging off the couch to try and catch her. Well, there isn't a catching her. You know, you're not going to get there. But it's your instinct to do it. She ended up fracturing her wrist, her right wrist. It was her dominant wrist. And that was the beginning of her decline. Now, if you would have given Mrs. L an MMSE exam at that point in time, she would have scored 30. She would have scored 30 out of 30. However, if you gave her that same mini mental status exam about a year later, because she was starting to functionally decline, because it was her right dominant hand, she stopped doing a lot of things for herself because she couldn't do them. 
And by the time she could do them again, she no longer wanted to do them to the point of even something as simple as dressing yourself. When your dominant hand is broken, you had a hard time dressing yourself. You had a hard time wiping yourself. One of the most difficult things to do when your right hand up, your right hand is or your dominant hand is broken, one of the first things you have to figure out is how am I going to wipe myself with my left hand? And so from that time on, she just got more and more dependent upon her about upon her family. So um, Mrs. L is still living in the in-law apartment attached to her daughter's house, and she loves her life. If you ask her every day, she, I love my life. I love what I'm doing. She <laughs> spends most of her time now um, with her new best friends, her new BFFs. Her daytime best friends are the Golden Girls and Madlock. <laughs> <laughs> and the beer has been replaced by Diet Pepsi. And Poland water, only Poland water. She was quite the fashionista, which I didn't tell you because I ran out of room on the table. But her newest fashions now, she used to always shop at Chico's or Macy's. And she had a new outfit for everything. Her newest what, uh, clothes are her nightgowns. She spends her life in her nightgowns. She loves her nightgowns. So we made sure that she just has the most fashionable. This one is Kate Spade. Nightgown. Okay. She, um, she's not cooking anymore, but she's really good at giving directions on how it should be done. <laughs> she goes on food pipas. For two and a half years, her daughter made macaroni salad every week. And that's all she wanted to eat was macaroni salad. And she used to have to sneak in other stuff or bribe her. If you eat this, I'll give you a little macaroni salad. Well, after about two and a half years of macaroni salad, she got tired of it. Imagine that, two and a half years of macaroni salad. So now we have moved on to, we've moved on to um, nacho cheese and chips, which I forgot to bring today. Okay, nacho cheese and chips and grapefruit. We go through three of these a week. Grapefruit, nacho cheese and chips, and Hormel Oval Spice Tam. <laughs> Sometimes I'm at that store three times a week for the Hormel Oval Spice Ham, and God forbid if they're out of it, I have to go find another grocery store that has it. So I told you that her new daytime BFFs are Golden Girls and Madlock, and most recently she's fallen in love with Hoss Cartwright on Bonanza. <laughs> and so that's how Mrs. L spends her life, and she'll tell you She's earned it. So that's the story of my mom and her progression with her neurodegenerative disorder. She has probably, if I had to give her a number, um, she would be in the major category right now. Um, she repeats herself over and over again. Yes, me, every morning starts the same. Now, what day is it today? And what do I have to do? Oh, I'm so cold. Is it raining out? Every day, whether it's sunny, warm, whatever. It's, it's cold out, isn't it? No, Mom, it's not. So we start the day every day. But if you ask her, <coughs> she's happy. She loves her life. There's nowhere else she'd rather be. So I tell you this so that you get to know the persons along your journey, realize their history, just like in the impossible story. You could tell that couple was just so much in love and, and they were just so into their family and, and so forth. It's really, it's really a, a very difficult um, thing to watch. Um, and, and so I think I'm gonna stop now because my time is up, but thank you for listening to me and I hope you remember um, most of this. <laughs>